All right, good to see everybody here this evening and a uh, little beautiful spring evening somewhere. Uh, just not here, but it's uh, good to be in church and uh, good to see you here tonight. All right, take your Bibles. Let's go to the book of Jonah. We're in Jonah chapter 3 this evening, Jonah chapter 3. We ended chapter 2 where the Lord spake unto the fish. It vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. In verse 1, chapter 3, The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah rose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. The word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne. And he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that He had said that He would do unto them, and He did it not. Father, add Your blessing here to the reading of this chapter from the book of Jonah. And Father, we ask for Your help this evening now as we come to glean the truths that You would have us to learn from this chapter tonight and from this particular part of the story of Jonah. Holy Spirit, give us understanding. Uh, open our eyes and, and help us to see what you want us to see here this evening. Help me to say what ought to be said and to leave unsaid things that don't need to be said. But Holy Spirit, I pray that you will minister to the people tonight and that you'll be the teacher and put the Word of God into our heart tonight. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Well, the whale has spit up Jonah on dry ground. Whoever is calling, tell them to call back after 8.30, and uh, that'll be good. So, and he must have been a sight to look at. I, I found come across this in preparing this. There was a kind of a man who survived being swallowed by a whale in 1891. Initially, he was thought to have been lost at sea in a whaling accident, but James Bartley was discovered when the whale was caught and cut open a couple of days later. He was pulled from the stomach unconscious, but he came around and eventually resumed his life as a whaler. The significant aspect of the account is that for the rest of his life, he was strangely bleached. He would laid in the gastric acids of the whale's stomach at temperatures around 105 degrees. That's hardly surprising. So it is not unreasonable to think that Jonah might have been similarly bleached. He'd, uh, he'd have been quite a sight to behold. And, and it would have been, uh, I don't think it would have been unnatural as he begins to approach Nineveh that somebody would have looked at him and said, what happened to you? <laughs> what, what, what is going on? And it would be his opportunity to tell him that this is what God did when I didn't want to listen to Him. Now how much more effective would it be when he tells them 40 days and God's going to judge you. Uh, they have a walking illustration of what God will do if you don't want to obey Him. And He might have been quite a sight. And so it just helped probably in the delivering of the message. And uh, all, of it, all of that fit together, just I think God would have it. Now, there's five noticeable things we're going to look at this evening as we look at Jonah chapter 3. Number one is the grace of God. The grace of God. 
You know, obviously, every time you can read the Old Testament, when Israel would be threatened by some heathen nations or some other more powerful nations, God was there to defend them. Would, would, and really, that's what Jonah wanted God to do to Nineveh and the Assyrians. He wanted God to just kill them, just, just utterly destroy them. Uh, would he destroy them like he did the Egyptians in the Red Sea? Would he uh, utterly have them wiped out like he wanted Saul to do to the Amalekites? You know, we, we know that God has pronounced judgment on different nations and different groups of people uh, like the Egyptians and some of the Canaanites um, that, that were rebellious and going against God and against his people. But you know, it's interesting if you look at those stories and where we sometimes miss it, sometimes we think that, well, God in the New Testament is a God of grace and love and mercy. And Boy, I'm sure glad we're not dealing with the God of the Old Testament. Well, i got news for you. The God of the Old Testament was a God of grace and love and mercy also. Uh, God's the same, and He, does, he never changes. And uh, if He doesn't change, He's not a different God now than He was then. And if you think about it, even when He had to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he didn't do so before first. He, he allowed, he didn't send anybody there, but he allowed Lot to go there. Now we know from the New Testament, Lot had a righteous soul. And so Lot was saved. In fact, through Abraham's prayer, he got Lot spared from the judgment that would come on Sodom and Gomorrah. But could Lot have been there as a light, as a witness? Was he there to try to be one last effort that God would give them to repent and turn back to him before he destroyed them? It would, could have been God reaching out in love and mercy even to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. I think that's what he did. Think about what he did with Joseph, sending Joseph into Egypt. And remember the seven years of plenty and then followed by the seven years of famine. But God, God didn't just take care of Israel. He could have just saved enough food that He would feed Israel, but He didn't. He fed all the of Egypt as well. How kind was that? How loving was that? The Egyptians didn't acknowledge Him. The Egyptians wanted nothing to do with Him, with God. And so, yet He still was good to them. He still fed them. He still made sure they had plenty. He raised up Joseph to be good to them as well has be good to, Ab to, to Israel because of the promises, of course, he made through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So oftentimes we, we think the God of the Old Testament was just the God of vengeance and judgment, and he was just in a bad mood in the Old Testament, but he sure is different in the New Testament. No, God was just as kind and loving and merciful then as he is now. And, and Jonah, I mean, no nation... Uh, if any nation deserved to be judged, it would have been Nineveh. It would have been Assyria. Nineveh is the capital city of Assyria. As we mentioned before in, in another study, how wicked they were. Really, only Sodom and Gomorrah could rival them when it comes to evil. They were wicked and violent and immoral, idolatry and greedy and just, just sinful and ruthless. In fact, Problem, what you're going to find out when we get to the next chapter in chapter 4, that's what Jonah was really upset about. He knew that God would be merciful. He knew that God was going to be compassionate to people, and he didn't want that to happen. But he figured that's what God was going to do. He knew God too well. And so he knew he was full of mercy and full of grace. He hadn't, it hadn't been written yet, but I think Jonah knew that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. He knew that. And Jonah, Jonah believed that it's just easier to throw some people away rather than work with them. That's how he felt about the Ninevites. Jonah believed some people didn't deserve a first chance, second chance, or third chance. He didn't even think they ought to get one chance. That's how he felt about Nineveh. In other words, have you ever, have you ever just thought about some people and, think, and dismiss them that they're not even, they ought not to even get saved? They don't even deserve to hear the gospel?
won't even waste our time trying to get the gospel to them. See, he believed, Jonah thought, I, why do I have to have a responsibility to take the gospel to people who hate me? Well, that's quiet. But we have a responsibility to take the gospel to every creature. That includes those who don't like us and those who would hate us. You know, he actually thought it's easier to take a ship to Joppa than go the 600, 700 miles to Nineveh to preach to them. He thought he was taking the easy way out. He found out that to go against God's the hard way out. Now God could have, after Jonah's running the other way and his disobedience, certainly God could have chosen someone else to go. God could have said, that's fine, you don't go, you don't go, I'll get someone else to go. For surely God's work's bigger than any one of us. But God didn't choose anybody else. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. And Jonah is going to get another opportunity. And he's going to have to take the message to the Ninevites. God didn't share Jonah's opinion that God could just get somebody else. I'm sure that's what he was hoping. The Lord decided to use Jonah, listen to me, even though he was difficult to work with. He was imperfect and difficult to work with. Because the same mercy and love that God wanted to bestow upon the people of Nineveh, God also wanted to bestow upon Jonah. God is merciful and God is kind and God is gracious to those who are without Him and those who have never heard the Gospel, but God is also kind and merciful and gracious to those of us who know Him and serve Him. There's not many of you in this room. How many of you, as far as you know, you got saved, you accepted Christ as your Savior the very first time you heard the story of Jesus. The very first time you heard it, you said, that's for me, I'm getting saved. Anybody like that? So God gave you a second chance. Yeah, some of you heard it often before you finally received it. You see, God was gracious. God was merciful. And so God is doing that not only with the uh, Ninevites, but he's wanting to do it for his servants as well. See, Jonah, I don't know about you, Jonah needed God's mercy and God's love and God's grace just as much as the Ninevites did. You and I do too. I mean, maybe here's a point, here's a, here's a place to put something in. Sometimes when a, somebody brings up someone's past sin, the Christian, our favorite, shouldn't say our favorite, sometimes the Christian's favorite phrase is, well, did that happen before they were saved? And if the answer is yes, they say, well, it's all been forgiven. It's all under the blood. Because now they're saved. Well, is the, is the blood different than after you're saved? <laughs> why, why do we think that if somebody sinned after they're saved, well, then the blood doesn't cover that so well? I think the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. It doesn't say those who are before they're saved or after they're saved. It's just when you confess your sin, God will be faithful and just to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's for everyone. The lost, yes, but for those who are saved as well. You know, We have to look at our own heart and our own life sometimes. And we have to ask ourselves, do we look at certain people and figure they're just not worth our time or effort? We don't need to spend our time or resources or efforts on them. I'd rather just spend all my time and efforts and resources on people I like. 
people I enjoy being around. People who can do something for me too. We grow and reach out, but only when it's kind of advantageous to us as well. Don't we sometimes think that, yeah, you know, God will reach them, but He'll send somebody else to reach them, not me. When you know very well, God may want you. We can fall into those traps real easily. We... We convince ourselves that we don't use our resources. And fast, first of all, they're not our resources anyway. They're God's. None of us have anything that we haven't received of the Lord. You know, in the end, we don't answer to our whims or our wills. We answer to the will of God. We're to live the rest of our time in our flesh, not to the will of man, but to the will of God. What does God want me to do? You know, all it's listen, all people can be rescued. All people can be redeemed, all people can be restored. <clears throat> Some, uh, you have to work harder than others. But I'm glad God doesn't give up. I'm glad God didn't give up on me. I hope you're glad God didn't give up on you. I'm glad the Word of the Lord comes the second time. And the third time. And sometimes the fourth time. So Jonah's, this story really is about God's mercy, love, and His grace. The grace of God. The second thing I want you to notice tonight is the obedience of Jonah. So the Word of the Lord comes a second time, and it says in verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching I bid thee. And Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. Well, boy, he'd have, he'd have saved himself a lot of problems. He'd have just done that back in chapter 1, wouldn't he? He would have just got up and gone right away. This time, there's no hesitancy at all. Now, it's a great city. It's the, the, the capital of Assyria. They had, it, it was very secure. They had 100, foot, 100 feet high walls. Wide enough, three chariots could ride upon the top of them. Population was probably between 500 and 600,000 people. Jonah obeyed right away. You know the hardest point? You know what the hardest point of obedience is? The beginning. It's the hardest to start. Sometimes rebellion, sometimes doubt, sometimes lethargy, certainly excuses or distractions. All will keep us from even starting to obey God. Once, once you begin to read your Bible, you don't want to stop reading your Bible. What's the hardest part? Getting started. Why? This needs done. That needs done. Distractions. I don't. I'm tired. I'm sleepy. Give me 15 more minutes of sleep. Lethargy. Things begin. Once you, once you start going out with a handful of tracks, you're going to witness to people. You don't want to quit. You know what the hardest door to knock on? First one. First one. That first step of obedience. The first prayer, the first word, the first act is the hardest. No great endeavor is ever achieved by wishing or hoping or dreaming. It always begins with an act of doing. 1 Samuel 2 verse 3. Talk no more so exceedingly, exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge and by Him actions are weighed. God is not concerned about 
intentions. God is weighing your actions. No running from God this way. No, no this time. No going the other way. In fact, it seems to, that he made pretty good time getting to Nineveh. We don't know where exactly the fish spit him out at. We don't know. It doesn't say. it Originally, if he was where he started from or where the boat was, it's about a 500-mile trip to Nineveh. Now understand, he didn't get on a jetliner and make the trip in a few hours. It's, that's a long way if you're walking. That's a long way if you're on the hump of a camel. That's a long distance, but he made good time. He seems to have gotten there quickly. The ultimate, the ultimate indication that you really believe something is not that you just agree and give mental assent to the truth, but that you obey what God has said. Does God know what He's doing? Does God know what's best for you and me? Absolutely. So, why do we second guess Him? Why do we doubt Him? Let me say this. Obedience is always immediate and obedience is always complete. Obedience is always immediate and obedience is always complete. I think that little Patch the Pirate song. I never think about obedience, but there's another little Patch the Pirate song. Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. Doing exactly as the Lord commands. Doing it happily. Action is the key. Do it immediately. Joy you will receive. Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. So, oh, it's just a kid's song. That helps this old man too. Uh, that helps to obey. How? And you, listen, immediately. I don't know about you. I, when, I, when my mom or dad or my dad told me to, to do something, and I said, yeah, I'll get to it. I don't know about you, that, that dog never hunted at my house. Uh, buddy, when he, when he spoke, you better get up and do it. Immediate obedience was expected. And as we know from Saul and the Amalekite caper, that complete obedience is expected. God expects you to do it completely what He tells you to do. So when God in His mercy and God in His grace affords you a second opportunity or a third opportunity or a fourth opportunity, obey! Obey immediately. Obey completely. Don't go the other way. There's only one way to do anything. That is God's way. Obedience is the secret of spiritual power. Obedience is the secret of spiritual power. The third thing I want you to notice this evening in Jonah 3 is the message he was proclaimed, the message to proclaim. Notice in, in verse number 2, God told Jonah, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Verse 4, Jonah began to enter in the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's the preaching that God said he was to preach. That's the message that God said He was to deliver. He's required to deliver the divine message and nothing else. Period. And that's what a prophet was always supposed to do. Only give what God has given to him. Not to add his own words in. It was God's message alone that his prophet would proclaim in God's name. When people wonder why revival doesn't come to our land, we have to look hard at what message is being delivered. Have we gotten away from delivering God's message? Have we funneled, have we, have we uh, just put our thoughts and our ways 
and watered down God's requirements. The message of Jonah is God can mightily use you as His messenger if you deliver His message. When Jonah proclaimed 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown, literally it will be overturned, it suggests that it was impending. It's going to happen. It's close. It's only 40 days away. 40 in the Bible is a number of judgment. And that's where, listen, that's where the Gospel always begins. It has to begin with warnings of God's judgment on sin. We can get so concerned that we want to win everybody over. And we want them to think that we're cool and we're okay. That we don't ever want to start out with the bad news. But it's the truth. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a preacher from yesteryear, wrote this. He said, The essence of evangelism is to start by preaching the law. It's because the law has not been preached that we have so much superficial evangelism. Evangelism must start with the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, the demands of the law, the punishment meted out by the law, and the eternal consequences of evil and wrongdoing. It is only when man is brought to see his guilt in this way, he flies to Christ for deliverance and redemption. We don't come to Christ just because, hey, you'll have a better life. Oh, really? Hey, hey John the Baptist, how'd that work for you? Hey, hey, Paul, how'd that work for you? Read 2 Corinthians 11 sometime and all that Paul went through. You see, we don't, we don't appeal now to people saying, listen, you uh, at that funeral Saturday for Brother Meadows, Stacy Meadows. Oh, and that's another prayer request too that Brother Talladay put up here. They, another man in their church passed away. Brother Ray, I think he said it was. So keep praying for Heritage Baptist Church. A lot of trials going through right now. Stacy Meadows, listen, he, he, his, his favorite witnessing tool was, you better get saved or you're going to bust hell wide open. You say, oh, that'll never work. Huh? Work for him. And, and I'm not saying you have to uh, use it, but listen, we, we can't sugarcoat the gospel. We can't try to make it so sweet and so palatable and just make it so wonderful now, wait a minute. There's a, there's a big preacher on television. You've heard me refer to this before. And I mean, no matter what the message is, and mostly it's just psychology and, and uh, 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 you know, I call it spiritual pablum, but they're just baby food. And then he comes on and says, now, you're watching today, and uh, if you've never been born again, we think you ought to get born again. And so bow your head and pray with me. And he leads them in some nice pretty prayer. Never mention sin. Never mention the cross of Christ. Never mention anything about hell. And then, then people say a little prayer with him, and then he says, okay, if you prayed that prayer, we think you've been born again. Well, you may think so, but God doesn't. I'm not trying to be mean. But, but what do you say from? What are, you, what are you coming to Jesus for? I was listening tonight to a preacher on the way in, and I agree 100% with what he said. He said he, he doesn't like it when people pray and, and say, well, I ask Christ to be a part of my life. Is that biblical? Christ doesn't become part of our life. Christ is our life. He is our life. When Christ who is our life shall appear. Without Christ, we don't have life. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. Aren't we? So without Him, there's no life. So he brings the message through Nineveh about judgment. 
in God's judgment upon sin. You see, Paul told the church of Corinth, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. We're preaching the gospel. I, my responsibility as the pastor of this church is to preach the message that God tells me to preach. Uh, Paul told Timothy, his young preacher, you know what he told him? Preach the Word and be instant, in season and out of season. Okay? Don't, he says they're going to be, and the reason he told them that, he said, you're going to come a time, Timothy, when people won't endure sound doctrine. They won't endure that sound teaching. What do they want? Tickle my ears. In other words, tell me what I want to hear. Scratch me where I itch. He said, Timothy, don't fall into that trap. Preach the Word. Preach the message that God has given. Paul told the church at Ephesus, he says, I've not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. That's the minister's responsibility. To declare unto you the whole counsel of God. And to give you God's message. But that's our message we take to the world. When revival comes, it's not going to come through laughing. It's not going to come through loud music. And it's not going to come through planned productions. It'll come as God's men proclaim God's truth and the message that God tells him to proclaim. And it's a message of judgment if you do not repent. Don't, don't let, listen, don't, don't follow the God you've made up in your mind. Follow the God of the Bible. Be careful. Well, we have number four, the response of the Ninevites. Well, how they respond to this message from the bleached out preacher telling them God's going to overthrow them. The people of Nineveh, verse 5, believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. And then the word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and satin ashes. And he caused to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. Let every man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Well, the response was they believed God. Now, it says Jonah, when he gave this, in verse number 4, he entered into the city a day's journey. Now, it says earlier that Nineveh was an exceeding great city of how many days' journey? Three. He only got a third of the way in. I don't know if he got the other two-thirds of the way or not. It doesn't say. But he only got a third of the way in, and boy, the people started believing God. In fact, word got to the king that there's this bleached out prophet coming through telling us God's going to judge us and overthrow us in 40 days. It's an astonishing response from people that you didn't expect to see it from. And though it's interesting, the secular historians of this day of Assyria and of this time period. They don't mention this at all. But I want you to hold your finger there in Jonah or put a bookmark in there if you would and look at Luke 11. Luke chapter 11. Turn over with me to Luke 11. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke 11 and notice with me Verse 32, where Jesus said this, The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. So how do I know that really took place? Jesus said it did. And that's good enough for me. Jesus said it happened, and it really happened. And it says they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And the great thing is they believed 
God. Now, did they repent or did they believe God? Yes. Repentance and belief are two sides of the same coin. You're not going to have one without the other. That's what Jesus was saying. They called a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. They're, they're, that was always a picture of uh, repentance and, and mourning. That they were humbling themselves before God. And the reaction was not just a few people. Everybody. And not just people. Animals. <laughs> he didn't let anybody eat. Nobody could drink. They were all expressing their grief and humility and repentance towards God. You know, God desires that our faith in Christ be seen. One of the best, strongest arguments for Christianity are the changed lives of people. If people don't see any change in us, why would they want to repent? Why would they want to change anything? Brother Gary mentioned going to a funeral the other day and he saw a lot of the people he grew up with. Gary didn't grow up as a Christian. In fact, he said a lot of the people who he knew growing up, they don't even believe in God. You know what the best testimony for them is of the gospel? Gary Van Sickle. That's right. One of those powerful tools in the prison when we go in and talk to guys at the prison is Danny Wright. You know why? Because Danny Wright says, 20 years ago I sat right where you sat. And now I'm coming in with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The point, man, you know what some of those guys sit there? They have to sit there and think, maybe God will do that with me. Maybe God will do that with me. That's a powerful testimony. You see? That's the, it's a great, a changed life. The king, right on down to the poorest of the land. Royal robes cast aside. Humbly sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Sitting on the ground. The posture of humility and self-abasement. Out in the open where everybody can see you. Not ashamed at all that we're humbling ourselves before God. Well, how did God respond to that? What's the last verse of chapter 3 say? God saw their works that they turned from their evil ways and God repented of the evil that He had said that He would do unto them and He did it not. The compassion of God. Now I want you to understand something. God didn't change. The Ninevites changed. You see, God, God, is, God responded to their change like He always would. He told Israel, if my people, which are called by my name, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I'll heal their land. God, is, God hadn't changed. He's doing exactly what he would always do. They changed. And so God responded like he always would. That's why Jonah knew that that's what he'd do. Ninevites changed their conduct, turned from their evil way. God would have been inconsistent if his attitude toward them remained the same despite their change in behavior. God is consistently against sin. God is consistently going to judge sin. 
There's no variation in his hatred of sin or his determination to punish it. But he's also consistent that he is always forgiving when we confess sin. He always is, is, is merciful when we confess and forsake our sin. He's consistent both ways. He's God. He doesn't change. Look at that. Turn over to Jeremiah chapter 18. For We're almost done. Jeremiah 18. Would you look there with me? Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah 18. This, of course, is the lesson that Jeremiah, God was showing Israel through Jeremiah of the potter's wheel. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying in verse number 5, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do to them. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plan it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I thought that I should benefit them. Now therefore go to, speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now every one from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. Because God says, if you do, listen, if you're going to be sinful and you're going to do wrong, I will judge you. If you turn from your wickedness, and you do the right thing, I'll be merciful to you. God is consistent, always. But God responds to what we do. He responds, what do you do? You want to draw nigh to God? God says, you draw nigh to me, and I will draw nigh to you. But God doesn't draw nigh to you until He sees that you you want to draw nigh to Him. He'll respond to what you want Him to do. You see, when, and it's interesting how he, in both places, in Jeremiah and in Jonah, he talked about turning from our evil ways. One of my pet peeves I pick with the Vice President of the United States, Mr. Pence, who I believe is a Christian man, likes to quote 2 Chronicles 7.14. But he always leaves that phrase out. That bugs me. My people which are called by my name humble themselves and pray. Seek my face and pray. And he says, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. No, he always leaves out, turn from their wicked ways. My friend, if we don't turn from our wicked ways, we don't turn to God. And he doesn't hear. And he won't heal and he won't forgive. That's not only for a nation, that's for us individually as well. Then we have God's compassion. Now, you're going to find out Ninevites are thrilled, God is thrilled, but somebody isn't. Jonah. He's not happy camper. We'll look at that next time we get into chapter 4. All right, let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the lessons we've gleaned here from Jonah, from the Ninevites and their response to the message that judgment is coming. Lord, we thank you for your grace to us. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for the undeserved favor you give to us each and every day. Thank you, Lord, there's many in this room that we would testify the word of the Lord came the second time. 
Lord, I pray that those in the room tonight who maybe need to hear that voice from you again because they ran away before. They, they, didn't, they didn't obey your voice. That this time there would be immediate obedience and complete obedience. And Lord, that when we hear the message that we'll turn from our wicked ways and know that you'll be compassionate And you'll forgive our sin. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us and being kind and merciful to us. Use us to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, forgive us for thinking that some people aren't worth it. That some people can't be changed. Lord, let us know and and remind us that no one is out of your reach. Everyone can be rescued. Everyone can be redeemed. Everyone can be recovered. So Lord, give us that your heart in that matter. And we'll thank you for it. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. Watch over us as we go our separate ways and give us safety over the highway. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.